Health and Safety Program Basics Health and Safety Policy Statement An organization's occupational health and safety policy is a statement of principles and general rules that guide the actions of all workplace parties. Senior management must be committed to ensuring that the policy's intent is carried out without exception. The health and safety policy should carry the same importance as the other policies of the organization. The policy statement can be brief, but it should mention management's commitment to protect the safety and health of employees, the objectives of the safety program, the organization's basic health and safety philosophy, who is accountable for what in the occupational health and safety program, the general responsibilities of all employees, that health and safety shall not be sacrificed for productivity or expediency that unacceptable performance of health and safety duties will not be tolerated. The policy should be stated in clear, unambiguous, and unequivocal terms, signed by the owner or chief executive officer, kept up to date, reviewed at least annually, communicated to each employee, posted in the workplace, adhered to in all work activities, enforced by all supervisors and managers. Responsibilities. Health and safety is the joint responsibility of management and workers. Management is accountable for non-compliance to health and safety legislation, and workers are responsible for their participation in the program and for working safely in accordance with the rules. Individual responsibilities apply to every employee in the workplace, including the chief executive officer. All employees should know exactly what is expected of each individual in terms of health and safety. Responsibilities of workers. Use personal protective equipment, devices, and safety equipment as required by the employer. Follow safe work procedures and rules of the workplace. Know and comply with all regulations that are relevant to the work. This knowledge is gained through training. Responsibilities of workers. Report any injury, potential injury, or illness immediately to supervisors. Report unsafe acts and unsafe conditions when they happen or when they are found. Participate in joint health and safety committees or as the safety representative. Participate in all required training. Responsibilities of first-line supervisors. Instruct workers on how the work is to be performed and use safe work practices. Enforce health and safety policies and rules. Correct unsafe acts and unsafe conditions immediately. Ensure that only authorized, adequately trained, and evaluated workers operate equipment. Report and investigate all accidents or incidents to find and eliminate causes. Responsibilities of first-line supervisors. Inspect work areas and take immediate remedial action to eliminate or minimize hazards. Ensure equipment is supplied as required, is used appropriately, and is properly maintained. Promote safety awareness in workers through regular communication, observation, and feedback. Responsibilities of management. Must anticipate, recognize, assess, and control all actual and potential hazards in the workplace, and then evaluate controls to ensure ongoing effectiveness. Provide all necessary ingredients or resources for a safe and health-conscious workplace. Establish and maintain a health and safety program and commit to maintaining the program. Ensure supervisors are competent and workers are trained or certified as required. Report accidents or incidents in cases of occupational disease to the appropriate authority. Provide sufficient and appropriate hazard-specific medical and first aid facilities. Ensure personal protective equipment is available appropriate to identify hazards. Provide workers with regular and relevant health and safety information. Support supervisors in their health and safety interventions and activities through appropriate resource allocation. Evaluate the relevancy of the health and safety program and the competency and performance of supervisors and leaders who maintain the program. 
Although responsibility and authority can be delegated to subordinates, giving them the right to act or senior management, it is important to understand that while some responsibilities can be delegated, senior management remains accountable for ensuring that they are carried out. To fulfill their individual responsibilities, the people must know what these responsibilities are. Ongoing communication is required. Have sufficient authority and resources to carry them out. Due diligence goes hand in hand with authority and accountability. Have the required ability and competence. Training or certification where required, including hands on training and experience. Rules and work procedures. Governmental health and safety regulations represent minimum requirements. In almost all cases, organizations will have to augment these regulations with specific rules. We need rules to protect the health and safety of workers, but there are dangers in having either too few or too many rules. Too few rules may be interpreted as a sign that health and safety is not important, or that common sense is all that is required to achieve them. On the other hand, too many rules may be seen as not treating employees as thinking adults and makes enforcement of all rules less likely. Rules and work procedures. Rules should be specific to the workplace. The Joint and Health Safety Committee should participate in their formulation. Rules should be in clearly understandable terms. Rules are best stated in positive terms. The reasons for the rule should be explained. Rules must be enforceable. Rules should be available to all employees in written form, translated as necessary. Rules should be periodically reviewed to evaluate effectiveness and validity. Rules and work procedures. Compliance with health and safety rules should be considered a condition of employment. Rules must be explained to new employees when they start work or if they are transferred or retrained. The employer must establish procedures for dealing with repeat rule violators. Supervisors are responsible for correcting unsafe acts, such as breach of rules. Points that should be considered in establishing procedures on this issue are ensure that employees are aware of the rules. Employees are not encouraged, coerced, or forced to disregard the rule by fellow employees. All rules are observed. No violation will be disregarded. Action is taken promptly. Guidelines for dealing with infractions may be desirable. Some flexibility is required when applying the guidelines as each case will vary in its circumstances. Action is taken in private and recorded. Procedures for safe work. Work procedures are the safest ways of doing a job, job instruction, monitoring performance, and investigating accidents. Job Safety Analysis, JSA, also known as Job Hazard Analysis, is the first step in developing the procedure. In this analysis, each task of a specific job is examined to identify hazards and determine the safest way to do the job. Job Safety Analysis involves the following steps. Select the job. Break down the job into a sequence of steps. Identify the hazards. Define preventative measures. The analysis should be conducted on all critical tasks or jobs as a first priority. Critical jobs include those where frequent accidents and injuries occur, those where severe accidents and injuries occur, those with potential for severe injuries, new or modified jobs, and frequently performed jobs such as maintenance. Job safety analysis is generally carried out by observing a worker doing the job. Members of the Joint Health and Safety Committee should participate in this process. The reason for the exercise must be clearly explained to the worker, emphasizing that the job, not the individual, is being studied. Another approach, useful in the analysis of infrequently performed or new jobs, is group discussion. A work procedure may consist of more than one specific task. Each separate task should be analyzed to complete a job safety analysis for that procedure. The final version of the correct work procedure should be presented in a narrative style format that outlines the correct way to do the job in a step-by-step -step outline. The steps are described in positive terms, pointing out the reasons why they are to be done in this manner. 
Reference must be made to applicable rules and regulations, and to that personal protective equipment required. Employees who carry out the tasks should be consulted in developing the procedure. Safety orientation. Health and safety education should start with employee orientation for new employees and employees transferred to a new job. Orientation sessions are an explanation of the function of the work unit, organizational relationships, administrative arrangements, and miscellaneous policies and rules. Inexperienced workers are involved in accidents at a higher rate than others. Both health and safety education and job skill training can improve this record. Items that should be included: emergency procedures, location of first aid stations, health and safety responsibilities, reporting of injuries, unsafe conditions and acts, use of personal protective equipment, right to refuse unsafe work, hazards in the workplace, reasons for each health and safety rule. New employees can be expected to absorb only a certain amount of information. A written summary outlining the orientation sessions is useful as a handout to employees and acts as a checklist for the person conducting the orientation. A buddy system is a useful follow-up to the orientation. This process also promotes the safety awareness of buddies. The new employee orientation may include a set of questions such as the following: What are the hazards of the job? Is job safety training available? What safety equipment do I need to do my job? Do I need to wear personal protective equipment (PPE)? Will I receive training on how to use the PPE? What do I do in case of fire or another emergency? Where do I find fire extinguishers, first aid kits, first aid rooms, and emergency assistance? What are my responsibilities regarding health and safety? If I notice something wrong, to whom should I report? Who is responsible for answering safety-related questions? What do I do if I get injured or have an accident? Soon after the orientation sessions, employees should be assessed on their understanding of the items discussed. Safety training programs. The objective of training is to implement health and safety procedures in specific job practices and to raise awareness and skill levels to an acceptable standard. Documented correct work procedures are very important in job skills training. Occasions when employee training may be required are: commencement of employment, reassignment or transfer to a new job, introduction of new equipment, processes or procedures, refresher, annual or periodic education and training to ensure skills and knowledge, inadequate performance. CSA standard Z113 Occupational Health and Safety Training Outlines suggested training for supervisors. The standard states that a supervisor should be competent, an example, have adequate knowledge, training, and experience on all processes and tasks over which they are exercising authority. Organizations should define what constitutes an acceptable combination of knowledge, training, and experience in relation to the supervision of others performing tasks. Topics that may be included in supervisor training include. Roles and responsibilities, legal and corporate, internal responsibility system, hazard identification, hazard control, risk assessment, emergency procedures, incident investigation, conducting planned inspections, auditing skills, training, planned task observation, communication skills, motivation and discipline, managing troubled employees, off-the-job safety. Problem-solving skills, first aid, WHMIS or chemical safety, industrial hygiene and medical surveillance programs, duty to accommodate. Receive training on how to instruct. Prepare an orderly plan for instruction. Explain reasons why each step must be done in a certain way. All instructors should plan the session beforehand. Break the job down into steps. Have training aids available. Explain what is to be done. Describe all the hazards and protective measures. Demonstrate each step. Stress key points and answer any questions. Have the employees carry out each step. Correct errors and complement good performance. Check frequently after the employees are working independently to ensure correct performance. Workplace inspections. Workplace inspections help to identify existing hazards so that appropriate corrective action can be taken. 
Health and safety legislation requires workplace inspections as a proactive action. Supervisors and workers are responsible for reporting and taking action on unsafe conditions and acts. The frequency of planned formal inspections may be set out in legislation. Consider records of previous accidents and potential for serious accidents and injuries when determining if more frequent inspections are needed. Trained health and safety committee members should carry out formal inspections. Criteria for selecting the inspection team are knowledge of regulations and procedures, knowledge of hazards in the workplace, experience with work processes involved. Planning any inspection is worthwhile. Documents of previous inspections, accident investigations, maintenance reports and committee minutes should be consulted. Inspection checklists are useful to ensure that no items are overlooked, but checklists should meet specific needs of the workplace. One type of checklist is the critical parts inventory. This inventory itemizes parts and items that may result in serious accident if they fail. The Joint Health and Safety Committee should participate in the preparation of these tailor-made checklists. During inspections, work conditions and procedures should be observed. If a hazard that poses an immediate threat is discovered, preventative action must be taken right away, not after the inspection. Notes are made specifying details of the hazard, including its exact location. When completing the inspection report, it is a good idea to classify each hazard by degree of possible consequences to prioritize for remedial actions. Example, A, major, B, serious, C, minor. Inspections serve a useful purpose only if remedial action is taken. Causes, not symptoms alone, must be rectified. Corrective action should be taken immediately with the emphasis on engineering controls, management failures, or a need for worker education, whatever applies. Incident Reporting and Investigation Occupational health and safety legislation in all Canadian jurisdictions requires that specific injuries in certain categories of accidents or incidents must be reported. There may be minimal legal requirements for their investigation. Many organizations investigate other events, example given, where damage did not involve injuries, and near misses. The health and safety program should specify what is to be reported, to whom it will be reported, how it is reported, which incidents are investigated, who will investigate them, what forms are used, what training investigators will receive, what records are to be kept, what summaries and statistics are to be developed, how often reports are prepared. Incident reporting and investigation. Accidents and incidents are investigated so that measures can be taken to prevent a reoccurrence of similar events. Investigation represents an after-the-fact response for any particular mishap. However, a thorough investigation may uncover hazards or problems that can be eliminated before the fact for the future. After causes have been determined, prompt follow-up action is required to achieve the purpose of the investigation. Emergency Preparedness Emergency procedures are plans for dealing with emergencies such as fires, explosions, major releases of hazardous materials, violent occurrences, or natural hazards. When such events occur, the urgent need for rapid decisions, shortage of time, lack of resources, and trained personnel can lead to chaos. The objective of the plan is to prevent or minimize fatalities, injuries, and damage. The organization and procedures for handling these sudden and unexpected situations must be clearly identified. The development of the plan follows a logical sequence. Compile a list of possible hazards or scenarios, for example, fires, explosions, floods. Identify the possible major consequences of each, for example, casualties, damage. Determine the required countermeasures, for example, evacuation, rescue, firefighting. Inventory the resources needed to carry out the planned actions, for example, fire extinguishers, medical supplies, rescue equipment, training personnel. Based on these considerations, establish the necessary emergency organization and procedures. Communication, training, and periodic drills are required to ensure the adequate performance when the plan must be implemented. Health and safety committees should be involved in emergency planning, preparation, and practice. Records of training and drills are to be maintained. 
outcomes, and any identified issues during drills should be used to verify the validity of emergency procedures. Medical Aid and First Aid Programs Implementing Health and Safety Programs First aid facilities and provision of medical aid are generally prescribed under health and safety legislation or workers' compensation legislation. The OSH program must include the following information. Location of first aid stations and medical facilities. Identification of first aid attendants. Identification of other staff trained in first aid. Policy on pre-employment and follow-up medical examinations. Procedures for transporting injured employees to outside medical facilities. Provision of first aid training. Procedure for recording injuries and illnesses. A policy on return to work after a lost time accident might appropriately be included in this section of the program. In general, if injured workers are offered alternative employment, their work should be suitable and productive. The worker's physician must agree that such employment will not harm the worker or slow down the recovery. The worker's treatment program does not include medication which impairs judgment or sensory perception. The worker will pose no threat to other workers. Provisions are made for workers to remain in active treatment where appropriate. The policy is applied to off-the-job injuries as well. The SPICE, the SPICE approach, produces better outcomes when managing return to work. Simple. Problems occur when simple, uncomplicated conditions are treated in a complicated manner. Proximate. Keeping an injured worker out of the workplace carries the risk of alienating the person from everyday activities, workplace relations, and increases uncertainty of return. Immediate. Early treatment. Avoid delays in obtaining treatment and returning people to meaningful, modified duty, and then full duty as quickly as possible. Reduces disability. Centrality. All parties work towards the common goal of returning to work. Expectant. Expectations about return to work are set appropriately, and people work towards those goals. A good health and safety program provides a clear set of guidelines for activities that, if followed rigorously, will reduce accidents and causes of occupational disease. The key to success is the manner in which the program is implemented and maintained. Senior management must demonstrate commitment and support the program by... Providing resources, such as time, money, and personnel. Ensuring that employees receive training or certification as required. Making all applicable health and safety information available to all employees, including health and safety performance, as part of employee performance's appraisals at all levels. Attending health and safety meetings. The program must be communicated to all employees. Special emphasis should be given to new workers, newly appointed supervisors, and new members of the Health and Safety Committee. Revisions to policies and procedures should be publicized. The program should be available in a single written document. However, if separate manuals have been developed for various elements, such as accident or incident investigation procedures, their use should be referred to in the main document. Once the health and safety program has been set in place and the program appears to be running smoothly, effort is still required to maintain enthusiasm and interest. Safety awareness can be enhanced by the setting of realistic goals and monitoring progress, distribution of all pertinent information, individual recognition for superior performance, continuing education and training, including general meetings, tailgate talks, and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Measuring effectiveness. It is best to use an audit as a before-the-fact measure of the effectiveness of an occupational health and safety program. An audit uses a checklist in which each element is subdivided into a series of questions. Each question is given a weighting factor depending on its importance. Records, observations, interviews, and questionnaires are used to evaluate performance for each sub-element. Thank you.